Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Trevor Brown and I'm a neuroscientist with the NeuroCare Group. In this episode, I'm going to chat with Dr. Mike Fox, Director of Harvard Medical School, about his research into brain connectivity mapping in mental health and its application to clinical treatment using brain stimulation and much more. So we hope you get a lot out of that. At NeuroCare, we're all about bringing the newest evidence-based treatment to everyday clinicians so we can make these therapies more accessible to more people. A great next step is to sign up for one of our online courses on the NeuroCare LMS. Here you can start learning how to apply TMS, neurofeedback or TDCS in your own clinical practice. This can be followed up by one of our practical workshops, which we hold worldwide. There's a link below. Thanks again. Enjoy the video and maybe see you in one of our live workshops. Welcome to NeuroCare Academy and um, look, thank you very much, Mike, for joining us. We've got Dr. D. Fox, neurologist and director at the Center for Brain Circuit Therapeutics from Harvard Medical School. Thank you very much, Mike, for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Trevor, for having me. Okay, excellent. Now, we met just a few months ago at uh, the challenge workshop called Non-Invasive Brain Stimulation in Crans Montana, Switzerland, and um, it was put together by Professor Luigi Paul Varenti for the Neuroscience School of Advanced Studies. And uh, it was a great week, wasn't it, Mike? How did you enjoy that? That's uh, probably the prettiest place I have ever been for a uh, conference. Uh, incredible group of people. Yeah. Yeah, and that was fantastic. And um, the director, Nolan Williams, got together a great team. Uh, there was Martin Arn, Charlotte Stagg, Connor Liston, Jonathan Downer. Um, what, what did we do during the week? There were some presentations, Mike, and some informal chatting. Yeah, I mean, just uh, you get a brilliant group of people together like that. I, I was honored to be a part of it and uh, just learn from my colleagues about how they're thinking about the future of, of non-invasive brain stimulation and, and was just very happy to contribute. And then I, I think the, the participants in the challenge workshop, yourself included, um, really added to it, brought in a fresh perspective and, and it, it was a good time, a really, really enjoyable meeting. Yeah, look, I really, uh, would really recommend it to anyone and um, it was fantastic to just to get that that, those structured presentations, but also the the unstructured, just walking up and down the mountains with you guys and, and chatting away. It was uh, really a great week. So, uh, look, the main focus for today, Mike, is to talk to you about your work and um, future directions for brain stimulation, your value to the, the, the brain stimulation community up until this point has been enormous, but we really want to focus today on a little bit on the functional connections work that you've been involved with, with fMRI, uh, really changing the way that we see mental health and individualizing treatment uh, for people based on their own individual neural circuitry. Can you just tell us in a, in a nutshell, in a couple of minutes, what, what the major um, branch of your research has been involved with? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's gone through an evolution. Um, so I, I think uh, during graduate school, I, I got into uh, this resting state functional connectivity. I was very fortunate to be at, at WashU in St. Louis, uh, working with people like Mark Rakel at a time where this technology was first emerging. Uh, the ability to put someone in an MRI scanner and look at spontaneous fluctuations in their brain activity. And it turns out these spontaneous fluctuations are, are correlated um, between uh, connected brain regions and correlated within connected brain circuits. And it gave us a very powerful tool for mapping out how the human brain is wired up and what the functional relationships are between different brain regions. And we did a lot of fun neuroscience with this new imaging technology. But as I kind of transitioned from being a, a PhD student into being a neurologist and got my medical training and, and my neurology training, um, I was constantly asking the question of, hey, now that we have this, this new ability to see how the human brain is wired up, it seems like that's got to be useful to help some patients. And in what area of, of neuroscience or, or neurology or psychiatry is, is primed where this brain connectivity information could be useful for improving therapy? And that's where brain stimulation came in. Uh, where we had um, amazing brain stimulation treatments like deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease or tremor or non-invasive brain stimulation for depression, where, where we knew we were getting clinical effects. We knew we were helping patients, but nobody really knew how it worked. Um, but there seemed to be uniform agreement that brain connectivity had to be playing a role and that as soon as we turned on a stimulator, 
that stimulation was immediately propagating to affect everything the stimulation site was connected to. So it didn't take long uh, to find collaborators that were interested in helping me put these things together to see whether or not this new uh, method for looking at how the brain's wired up could help inform our brain stimulation therapies. Fantastic, Ex excellent. And, um, and so you're using this now in your clinical practice and the, all, the goal of all this research is to, to be able to put this into the clinical practice in terms of um, brain lesions, focal ultrasounds, but also non-invasive brain stimulation like transcranial magnetic stimulation. Is that right? Is that what you're using at the moment? Yeah, so I, I would say it's very much um, uh, is part of my research practice. So 100% we're using this, this technology and this, this wiring diagram of the human brain to understand how lesions can cause the symptoms they cause or understand how brain stimulation can have the effects it has. And on the research side, we're, we're using this to try and make these treatments better. Now, on the clinical side, um, I'd say we're just beginning to reach the point where some of this research is beginning to translate into our clinic. Um, but for the most part, these clinical treatments are still administered. The way they were administered in the big randomized control trial led to the FDA approval in the first place. Um, and the reason that there's a divide there is, you know, once you have a big randomized clinical trial proving that something's safe and effective, there's a very large hurdle to try and make that treatment better based on a research idea. Um, and so we're probably going to spend a lot of this podcast talking about the, the research ideas and the exciting research that we're doing. But, but I do think it's important for the clinicians on the call to, to understand that there is still a gap there. There is still a translation process that has to occur uh, for us to begin to implement these exciting research findings in our clinical practice. And so I'd yeah. say, you know, most of my clinical practice is still just doing it the way that everybody else does it um, with some research pieces that are beginning to filter in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's a long journey, isn't it? And uh, it takes some time for this to, to come into clinical practice. But exciting. It's exciting to know that it's just around the corner. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about um, your education there, but can you just start to um, tell us a little bit about where you grew up in the States? Uh, was it only in the States and your ed education there? Yeah, sure. So so uh, I don't know if this has come up in a prior interview, so I, I like how you're starting. So no, I, I grew up in um, kind of a, a rural area of Ohio um, in between Cincinnati and Dayton. A uh, smaller town called Westchester, Ohio, a really great place to grow up, uh, you know, in the woods, playing in the creek every day, making forts, um, went to uh, went to a Jesuit high school in Cincinnati um, called St. Xavier High School. Very um, good high school, um, both for academics, but then also for growing you as a person. And that um, kind of set me up for a, a wonderful experience at Ohio State University. Uh, where I went and did my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. Um, and it's a great school for engineering. It's actually a great school for um, smart people. You know, I, you don't think of Ohio State as being up there with, you know, the Ivy League uh, universities of the world. But if you if you take the honors classes at Ohio State and looked at, you know, the average SAT score of the people in these honors classes, it would beat out MIT and Harvard for most of the classes. So it was really a, a cool place to get an undergrad. Um, and then after that electrical engineering degree, um, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Um, I did engineering in part because I figured it would keep me pluripotent. I could do law, I could do business, I could do medicine, I could do graduate school. And then I, I heard about this MD PhD program uh, and actually had a friend from Ohio State that was also an electrical engineering major go to Wash U's MD PhD program a year ahead of me, uh, gain a guy named JD Wiley. And, um, and so I figured, hey, that seems like a pretty cool path. Um, let's give it a whirl. And so I uh, ended up moving to St. Louis to, to do the Wash U MD PhD, which was, again, incredible. I told you a little bit earlier about how much I loved graduate school and working with Mark Rakel and being in a place as they were just developing a new imaging technology. Um, but the, the MD part of it was also very nice. Um, and that took me about seven years to do an MD PhD I did an intern year at Wash U at Barnes Jewish Hospital. That's when I moved to Boston to do my neurology residency and my my brain stimulation and movement disorders fellowship. Fantastic! And that's when you started. Is that when you published around 2005 the information 
on the two attention systems, dorsal and ventral attention network. Is that approximately that, that period? Yeah, so I was back in graduate school. So I was when I was a PhD student with Mark. Um, and, and we first kind of got this resting state functional connectivity um, up and running in a way that we were happy with. It took a, about a year, year and a half of software development of trying different processing strategies before we were convinced that there was something in this data other than just noise. Um, and, and a lot of people had actually looked at resting state functional connectivity. In fact, that the first paper was by Bharat Biswal in 1995, showing that you could do this, that you could look at the correlations and the spontaneous activity. But between 1995 and 2005, a lot of the focus was on, you know, is this all noise? Are we just looking at respirations? Are we looking at cardiac pulsations? Is this just people moving in the scanner? Um, and, and it wasn't until, you know, close to 2005 that people started publishing, you know, functional connectivity networks that we looked at and, and said, wow, this, this looks real. In fact, it was a paper by Mike Gracious out at Stanford where he um, looked at functional connectivity in the default mode network. And that's multiple different vascular territories, right? So you really couldn't blame physiological noise on that. That had to be neural activity giving you that pattern. And I still remember Mark Rakel walked out with Mike Gracious's paper and he slapped down on my desk and he said, we need to do this. We need to figure out how to make this work. Um, so once we got it working, then we just used it to map out a lot of things that, um, that, that Mark was interested in. So, you know, the first thing we looked at was, um, you know, the relationship between these brain areas that tend to go up when you do a task and these other brain areas that tend to go down when you do a task. And we found that these two set of areas were um, negatively correlated, or, or we use the term anti-correlated, um, even at rest. And that gave us a lot of insight into why you might be seeing these regions go up and other regions go down when you do a wide variety of different tasks. And then right around the corner was Maurizio Corbetta, who's you know a world's expert in attention. And he was very interested in the dorsal and ventral attention systems. And you know what are these attention systems doing when you're not attending to anything, when you're just resting? And we were able to kind of map out these attention systems just based on these patterns and spontaneous activity. And kind of on it went mapping out different, you know, brain networks or brain circuits that were of interest to the faculty that was at WashU. Fantastic. And then you went from those attention systems with, uh, with Corbetta and, um, and started to look at the differences between uh, the normal population and psychiatric populations. Um, I think it was around... 2010, you, you, you started to look at it as a, a preoperative mapping tool and differences in, in psychiatric populations, those sorts of things. You, you sort of moved on to some things that you were interested in rather than uh, the attention systems. Yeah, we, we did a few things. I, th I think one of the things I was most interested in is, is um, uh, you know, trial to trial variability, right? So, um, you know, this was at a time where everybody in the world was still focused on task-based activation, right? Task-based fMRI. And one of the things that was the bane of the existence for people to try to map out um, networks based on what goes up when you tap a finger, right? You, you mentioned preoperative mapping. If you're trying to do preoperative mapping by having someone tap their fingers, there's so much noise in that signal that they have to tap their fingers over and again, over again, over again, over, and you have to average all that signal together in order to get a clean map of where the motor cortex is. And so one of the things that, that I started looking into is how does spontaneous activity interact with task evoked responses? And is it just kind of ongoing activity that's just adding noise into our task evoked measurements? And if so, can we show that these two are sitting on top of one another and show that the variability in task activation is actually driven by the ongoing spontaneous activity? And in fact, if it is, can we show that that actually is introducing noise or variability into our behavior? Um, and we were able to show those things. Um, and, and so again, it's just very basic neuroscience, right? Of, of how do we understand ongoing spontaneous activity, variability in behavior, variability in task evoked brain responses. Um, and it, it wasn't until later that, that, you know, the question came up, all right, you know, can we use this to identify circuit abnormalities in neurological or psychiatric populations? And so, you know, we, we did a little bit of that, um, but I actually quickly moved away from it. And, and the main reason I did is that there were hundreds of researchers waiting to adapt this technique and use it to study that question. 
Um, and so if you were interested in schizophrenia, you used it to study schizophrenia. If you were interested in depression, you used it to study depression or Alzheimer's or whatever it might be. And so, you know, by the time I, I wrote this review article with Mike Gracious, and I think it was 2010, you know, people had used this technique to study almost every disorder you can think of. And um, we wrote that review article not to say, hey, everybody should do this. Um, we actually kind of wrote the review article to say, hey, everybody's already done this. Um, what else can we do with this technique? Mm -hmm. um, or if you're going to do this, this is the way that we would do it correctly. Um, because I, I think there was a lot of um, underpowered studies looking at these abnormalities that either weren't reproducible or, or didn't amount to much. Um, and so the question was, is, is the true value of this technique really just finding differences between group A and group B, or is there something else that we can do with this technology? And so that's something else that you can do with this technology is, is that when you, you came across the TMS and actually manipulating the brain connectivity with TMS, you published in 2012 about um, the connectivity uh, between different brain regions, I think it was DLPFC and, and anterior cingulate, uh, probing with TMS. Is that when you moved into that area? Yeah, exactly. And um, and and in that study, it wasn't um, looking at differences between normal subjects and depressed subjects, right? Um, it was using um, brain connectivity average across, you know, a hundred or a thousand healthy subjects, right? You can think of it as a an atlas. This is the the wiring diagram of the average human brain. And and that had very, very robust signal to noise in it, right? I talked about these underpowered studies looking at group A versus group B, well, once you put 100 subjects or 1,000 subjects together, that is the wiring diagram of the human brain, right? Um, and, and so now that we have that as an atlas, how could we use that to answer clinically relevant questions? So it's not, you know, what are the differences in connectivity between healthy and depressed? Um, it's more, uh, um, where do we need to stimulate to help depression? And so that was the big clinical problem at the time. And nobody really knew where we should hold the TMS coil to go ahead and help depression. Um, there was this idea that, oh, it's somewhere over the left frontal cortex. Okay, great. That, that's a big area of brain. Where over the left frontal cortex? And so at, at the same time, there was all this interest in, you know, the subgenual cingulate and the limbic system. And, oh, you know, this is our DBS target for depression. So we said, hey, if if the limbic system and the subgenual cingulate is such a critical node for depression, maybe the spot in the frontal cortex that we should be stimulating is the spot that's connected to that. Well, that's when we turn to our wiring diagram of the human brain, the atlas, and we can say, hey, we now have a tool that can tell us exactly where in the frontal cortex would be the ideal spot to stimulate if the goal is to find the spot that's connected to the limbic system. And so the, the 2012 paper was really kind of just a concept paper saying, hey, you know, here's the limbic system or the subgenual cingulate, here's connectivity with that, and, and does that line up with spots in the frontal cortex that seem to be more versus less effective for depression? And, and at a rough approximation, it did line up. And that set off this idea that, hey, maybe you can identify the brain circuit that you need to hit to pick out what node in the frontal cortex you should go after to, to hit a distributed circuit. And so it kind of moved, um, I won't say moved the field, because people were already thinking in terms of circuits and circuit targets. And, you know, the original studies on TMS repression knew it wasn't just one region. They knew it wasn't just the frontal cortex. They knew they were going after a circuit. Um, it just took a while for the technology to catch up with their idea to say, OK, now we actually have a tool that can visualize the circuit that you were going after all along and help us figure out where in the frontal cortex might be the right spot to get at that circuit. Hmm. And you're in a really um, you know, uh, interesting position as a neurologist, having had experience with deep brain stimulation, and, and the deep brain stimulation actually is able to get to those deeper brain regions and stimulate areas of the cortex. And did that inform your knowledge of the connectivity and the circuitry involved in, in depression at all? Yeah, no, 100%. It played a major role. Um, in, in the sense of um, you know, TMS is, is definitely a, a very powerful and impressive treatment. And I've seen patients have, you know, miracle level responses, but it's not everybody. 
and the effect size is still nowhere close to what you see with deep brain stimulation. Um, when you turn on those DBS electrodes and somebody's massive severe tremor just stops dead in its tracks, right? Or, mm-hmm. or you turn on somebody with Parkinson's DBS electrodes and all of a sudden they get up out of their wheelchair, right? And they walk around. I mean, it, it, that is a miracle, right? And so part of my thinking and motivation was to say, hey, we've got these massive effect sizes with deep brain stimulation. Um, how do we leverage that to improve something like non-invasive brain stimulation? And, um, and, and at the same time, we were seeing a lot of um, cross-modal translation where people were trying to use TMS to treat Parkinson's, right? Well, we, we know that DBS works really well for Parkinson's, so you got to be going after the same circuit, right? If you can stimulate this deep spot and stimulate this surface spot, well, they got to be connected and related to one another. Um, same thing with depression, right? This is when Helen Mayberg was doing her pioneering work of, of subgenual DBS, and we, we got to say, okay, there, there, there's got to be a, a relationship, a connection between what, what Helen Mayberg's doing with her DBS electrodes and what we're trying to do with our TMS coils. Um, and so the, the, the DBS very much motivated the thought process, but it was more this idea of if DBS works for this symptom and TMS works for this symptom, you got to be just hitting different nodes in the same circuit. So can we use this circuit imaging technology to back out where that circuit might be? and refine our DBS targets and refine our T- TMS targets. And so what you found using your techniques from that anti-correlation that you were talking about before, so you were starting to probe different areas of the DLPFC, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, with TMS, and you were getting some anti-correlation with deeper brain regions being the ACC or the subgenual anterior cingulate to actually I- identify and pinpoint the area on the DLPFC for an individual. Is that correct? Well, you, you actually make it sound like we did a lot more work than we did. <laughs> so, so, so people t- oftentimes think, you know, that we we actually went in and TMS multiple different spots in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to see which spot would actually modulate the subgenual. Um, we didn't do that. That work came much later. Um, uh, Desmond Oaths is doing some of that. Um, there's great work um, out of Stanford uh, of people working on that. But but at the time, um, we didn't have TMS fMRI. We couldn't do those types of experiments. And they're very hard to do. Um, the, the signal to noise is not great when you try to, to TMS different spots and see what that does to a deep lick region. Um, instead, what we did was much, much simpler. We just said, hey, here's the spot we want to modulate um, in the subgenual cingulate. So that's our seed region. All right, what's it connected to? Ah, it's connected to this spot in the frontal cortex. Okay, um, let's take other data um, from the TMS literature and say, is there any evidence that as we get closer to that spot, people tend to respond better? And we said, okay, well, we don't have a lot of evidence, but here's one trial that stimulated spot A versus spot B, and spot A was a little bit better. This was Paul Fitzgerald's work. And we said, hey, that lines up with this topography. And then we took another uh, paper where they just recorded the stim site of everybody that got TMS and said, hey, we don't know why, but if you go a little more anterior and lateral, that tends to work better. We said, hey, that lines up with our our map and our our ideal spot. And so it was really just an idea that seemed to line up with our existing evidence. Um, We didn't do an experiment. We didn't bring anybody in. We didn't TMS anybody. We just said, hey, these two things seem to line up kind of well. Um, So here's an idea. Right, right. Uh, so, so, so what you did, and the idea that you had, has led to some some future work. And and around 2018, you you identified some re- reproducible targets for for depression and TMS based on the con- connectivity connectivity. There is is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it it, it was actually just um, prospectively trying to validate this observation. So I told you that that 2012 paper was just making use of what had already been published in the literature and saying, hey, does our idea line up with all available data that we can get our hands on? And the answer was, yeah, it did. Um, But then the next step is you start collecting new data, say, okay, does it line up with the new data? So we just started recording the stimulation site of everybody that came into our TMS clinic saying, hey, do we see the same thing? Is, Is it the closer that we happen to get to this ideal spot, does that tell us who tends to get better versus not? Um, and and it, it did. It worked. Um, so so the closer people 
were incidentally stimulated at this ideal spot, um, the better they did. Um, and then um, uh, Robin Cash in Australia was, was collecting data at the same time with Paul Fitzgerald and got a very similar result. Uh, and again, neither of these was targeting this ideal spot. It was just trying to prospectively replicate what we saw with these old data sets in 2012, which is just recording the incidental stimulation site and seeing if the response lined up with the topography that we had predicted, and it, and it did. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, so you know, the, the work that's being done now is how do you see it um, being applied in the future? Do you think that on an individual level, we're getting to the point where we can actually choose this spot correctly? Or are we still going to, I mean, you said it, it tends to be a little bit more anterior and lateral, like the beam method rather than the five centimeter rule. Um, do, do, you, do you see any potential for actually individualization in the near future? Yeah, I, I, I do. So there's there's a lot of different directions uh, as to where we go from here, right? So, um, you know, before we get into the individual individualization, one is just, you know, do we have a new target for TMS for depression, right? In other words, um, the way we do it clinically is five and a half centimeters in front of motor cortex, right? Or we use the BMAP3 approach, but, but both of those are based on scalp measurements. And so, you know, are we at the point where we say, aha, these are the MNI coordinates that we should be targeting for depression? Um, and I'd say the, the answer is not known yet. Um, so some people would say yes. So Jonathan Downer, when he launched his um, you know, landmark 3D trial, he said, yeah, we are at that point. Um, we're going to compare 10 hertz to theta burst. And in every one of these patients, we're going to neuro navigate to these MNI coordinates that is the ideal spot that's anticorrelated with the subgenual, right? But, but we kind of missed a piece there, right? We never said, okay, let's do a randomized controlled trial, hit these ideal MNI coordinates versus scalp-based targeting, right? Versus five and a half centimeters or BMF3. Um, so nobody's ever done that trial. So we don't know if, you know, targeting those MNI coordinates actually leads to a better antidepressant response. I think there's people that think it probably does. There's people that think it maybe doesn't, but but the answer is we, we really just never did that trial. And it would have to be a very large trial um, to be powered to detect that difference. Because some people that get scalp-based targeting will incidentally be stimulated exactly where we would want to stimulate, right? So, so you need a lot of people to prove that neuronavigation to that MNI coordinate is better than what we do clinically, which is scalp-based targeting. And again, it's got to be a fair bit better because now you didn't need an MRI scan in everybody, which is an extra added cost um, when scalp-based targeting, you know, 50, 60 percent of people do do respond um, mm -hmm. without the MRI. So I'd say that's question one is, is do we have a better coordinate to stimulate for TMS for depression? And, and we just don't know the answer to that yet. Um, and we might never know because you'd have to power the trial so large in order to get that answer. Uh, your second question is, okay, are we at a point where we can individualize the treatment? So that's now the next step, which is, okay, we don't have just an optimized group-based target, but now what we're going to do is we're going to map out everybody's individualized circuit. So where is their spot that's anticorrelated with the subgenual? And is that spot the ideal TMS target for depression? Again, nobody ever did that trial where they compared individualized anti-subgenual targeting to scalp-based targeting. Instead, uh, you had people like Nolan Williams that said, hey, I'm just going to assume it's better, and I'm going to build that into my next trial, kind of like Jonathan Downer did for his 3D trial. Um, and he built it into his um, you know, accelerated theta burst, or, or what he calls um, his SAINT protocol. Um, but there was a lot of different things that went into to that, including delivering TMS every hour on the hour for 10 times per day, rather than delivering stimulation once per week. Um, but but he did it to this individualized anti-subgenual node and got these phenomenal response rates. So now 80, 90 percent of people were not just responding, they were remitting. Um, and those are, you know, levels that you don't even see with ECT. Um, so how much of it is this individualized anti-subgenual targeting and how much of it is just whacking people every hour on the hour? You know, no, nobody knows, you know, what what all the different parts of his recipe are are most important. But again, it's kind of one of those things of, hey, it sounds like this is a good idea. 
rather than do this really expensive randomized trial, we're just going to assume this idea is right and move on to the next step. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think at this point, we've got individualized anti-subgenual targeting. It's part of the SAINT treatment. Um, and it may or may not be a critical component, but it seems to be working pretty well. And then we've got an, you know, an average group-based target that they used in the 3D trial that may or may not be better, but we know how it does in the 3D trial. Um, and we know that if you stimulate that coordinate, the theta burst is equal to 10 hertz. Um, and then I'd say the last part, and probably where I put my nickel down, is beginning to individualize it based on symptoms. So one of the things that we saw in the 3D trial is that when they moved and did neuronavigated TMS, you know, they never compared it to scalp-based targeting, but you can look at the average response rates in that trial, and they didn't get this dramatic boost in response rate, right? And that really bothered me because if we're right, and that's a better treatment for depression, you know, you would have hoped to see, you know, uh, uh, in, you know, increased in efficacy with his trial. And so one of the things that we think might be going on is symptom specificity, that, that not all symptoms of depression require the same target. And so to truly individualize it, it might not be, oh, let's individualize it based on individual functional connectivity like Nolan did. It might be, let's look at what circuits are responsible for what symptoms and say, okay, what are the symptoms that are the biggest problem in this patient? Um, because maybe it's the anxiety questions in the depression questionnaire, right? Maybe it's the guilt questions. Maybe it's the concentration questions. And that's all part of our quote unquote depression. But almost certainly those things don't all map onto the same circuit target. And so maybe that is a higher yield way to individualize it. And again, that's what we do in DBS for Parkinson's. So, so it might not be the DLPFC and its connectivity to the ACC, which is necessarily highly correlated to this person's symptoms. It might be like Jonathan Downer's group looking at dorsomedial area or the orbitofrontal cortex, which is most highly related to the most severe symptoms of this patient. So I guess your work with knowing the connectivity of the human brain can elucidate that a little bit for us and, and, and we can say, well, for instance, individualizing for this patient, it might be time to, to try the dorsomedial rather than different specific areas around the DLPFC. Yeah, exactly. I'd say the only, um, uh, it, it, yes, and, and, and the stuff that Jonathan Downer is, is getting um, based on, you know, his clinical intuition and seeing a lot of patients and trying a lot of targets, you know, and, and you know, his is almost a trial and error approach based on what this brain region does, right? What does dorsal medial do? What does orbital frontal do? Let's try and target it in a bunch of patients. Let's see how those patients do. And then he refines his algorithm. Um, and it's really a, a very powerful approach to find new targets and find what targets best for which symptoms. And then our, on our end, we, we do something similar, but we we bring brain connectivity into it. And so we say, okay, you know, here's a data set of 100 patients. Everybody got stimulated at a slightly different site. Um, this is what those different sites are connected to. So now we can back out what brain circuit do we need to be hitting to improve different symptoms of depression. Um, and this is a paper that Sean Siddiqui put together um, fairly recently. Um, suggesting that there might really be two big circuit targets for two big clusters of depression symptoms. And right now, Sean is testing that prospectively by targeting one circuit and half the patients and targeting the other circuit and half the patients and saying, hey, you know, do different sets of symptoms get better depending on what circuit we're hitting with TMS? Right, right. And try to sift through all those symptoms and relate them to the, the circuitry involved. It's um wow, it's, it's a it's a pretty exciting um decade of brain brain stimulation research in psychiatry. Um uh Mike, look, when when from your perspective as a neurologist and, and you're working with um lesions and focal ultrasounds, and you, you also got a great knowledge of TMS, are there courses for courses a little bit here? Are it certain interventions for certain types of populations. Can you sort of elucidate for us a little bit about what you use different techniques for? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so a lot of it is is historical, right? In other words, um, you know, they, they actually had lesion-based treatments for psychiatric disease before they had lesion-based treatments for movement disorders. Um, but for you know, reasons that you're you're well familiar with, those lesion-based treatments for psychiatric disease 
um, fell out of favor. You know, they were doing frontal lobotomies, things that were very nonspecific that had um, pretty severe side effects. And that, um, in a way, you know, tainted lesion-based intervention for psychiatric disease, right? Um, versus lesion-based treatments for movement disorders, they also had a lot of side effects. All the first patients that got lesions for Parkinson's were left paralyzed on half of their body, but it stopped their tremor, so it was considered a win. Um, you know, and so a lot of it's just been historical of trying to use the technologies that we have at the time for treating a lot of different symptoms, and then. The ones that um, converge on treatments where the benefits outweigh the side effects and the risks, those treatments persist and get refined, like lesion treatments for movement disorders. Um, in those areas where you chose poorly or the lesions were too big and the side effects were disproportionate relative to the benefit, like psychosurgery, those treatments understandably fell out of favor. Um, and then, you know, as they were doing lesion-based treatments for movement disorders, they noticed they could turn on the DBS electrode and not create a lesion, but have a similar benefit. So that led to DBS for movement disorders, right? Um, and then when they were developing TMS, well, you know, they could see the TMS was having a physiological effect on the motor cortex. Um, that was at a time where they had just gotten a lot of new data suggesting that the left frontal cortex was critical for depression. Um, where they looked at lesion-based treat, you know, uh, not treatments, but just incidental strokes that cause depression, and they seem to be more in the left frontal cortex. And they looked at imaging and people with depression; they seem to have decreased activity in the left frontal cortex. And they said, "Hey, we've got this new TMS coil that can apparently excite cortical tissue. What's the disorder that seems to be a problem of not enough excitation in some part of cortex that we can get to? All right, depression makes sense. Let's give it a try." Um, but but I, I think, you know, that led to the let's use this type of neuromodulation treatment for this type of symptom and let's use this different type of neuromodulation treatment for this different type of symptom. And so, you know, DBS was owned by neurology and neurosurgery and used for neurological conditions, but only recently has it started to be used for psychiatric disease. And then non-invasive brain stimulation has been more in the, the realm of psychiatry and, and just now beginning to translate into neurology. And then, you know, lesion-based treatments, well, our only focus ultrasound treatment um, FDA approval right now is, um, uh, you know, burning a lesion for tremor. Um, but we just got authorization to start the first U.S.-based trial of focus ultrasound for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, so I think that, that history dictated what brain stimulation treatments to use for what disorder. But the future is recognizing that all of these symptoms map onto brain circuits. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about a neurological symptom or a psychiatric symptom, it's the brain circuit that is the target. And you could go after that brain circuit with DBS, with focus ultrasound, with TMS, with new technology around the corner. Um, and, and so I think that's the future. It's this translation between different departments, different specialties, um, different experts in different forms of neuromodulation. Um, that, that's actually the whole motivation for launching the center that we launched is, is the idea that, hey, we've got to get the neurosurgeons talking to the psychiatrists, talking to the neuroradiologists, and the TMS people need to learn from the DBS people and vice versa, because I think that they're all going to be operating from a similar set of, of circuit targets and a similar set of principles and constraints that will um, help all these fields uh, get better. Yeah, fantastic. So you, you mentioned their focus ultrasound, and uh, I, I think it's something that people know less about. Can you tell us just a little bit about what it is and the benefits of that compared to other techniques like deep brain stimulation or other techniques that may have more side effects? Yeah, so it's a, it's a new way to create a lesion. So we've had lesion-based treatments for things like tremor for a very long time, um, but the way we had to um, place that lesion was you still had to drill a hole in the skull, put an electrode down into the brain, try and figure out where the right spot is, and then turn on that electrode and burn a hole in the brain, right? But there's a risk of infection, there's a risk of bleeding. Um, you got to try and get that that you know RF probe in the right place. And you know originally when they were doing these lesion based treatments, you know they had ventriography, they didn't even have CT scans, right? So you're literally trying to get this electrode in the right spot to burn a hole based on where the ventricles are located, right? So, so the ability to um, not burn a lesion 
and have a DBS Electra that you can turn on, but more importantly, turn off if you ended up in the wrong spot, that was a huge advance. And then the ability to change where that stimulation was, right, to different spots on that DBS electrode could correct for the imprecision that we had in knowing where our target was and getting to our target. So they did a head-to-head -head trial of deep brain stimulation versus lesion-based treatment for tremor and DBS1, right? It gave better tremor benefit with fewer side effects, but that was many, many decades ago, right? Focus ultrasound comes along and they say, hey, this is a new technology for burning a hole in the brain. No longer do we have to you know, drill a burr hole um, and risk infection, risk bleeds. Now we, we basically put a bunch of ultrasound transducers on the scalp. We target a specific location in an MRI scanner and can burn a hole very precisely. Um, and you know that's been very attractive for a lot of patients. Um, especially patients that don't want DBS. Um, and and I'll, I'll be very clear that when Focus Ultrasound first came out, um, I didn't like it. And I would go to conferences and talk it down and say, hey, we did the head-to-head -head trial. We've been there. We tried DBS versus lesions. Lesions failed. To go back to a different way of making lesions, that doesn't make any sense. DBS is such a good technology. Why would you want to replace it with something? And then what finally changed my mind was the patients, is that you know, the patients would, uh, I'd send them to Reese Cosgrove at Brigham just to find out about focus ultrasound and say, he'll go tell you about that, but then come back and get DBS with me. And I never see the patient back again. And, and what it was is patients were saying that they really don't want electrodes in their head. Um, if there's a lesion-based treatment that is close to being equally effective with, without horrible side effects, they're willing to tolerate it. They understood that DBS was a little bit better um, but they wanted the lesion anyway. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons I moved to Brigham is to go all in on this technology because, you know, we're also in, you know, version, I think, 2.0 of focus ultrasound intervention. Um, the technology is in its infancy. And so as we refine the technology and get better and better at placing lesions in different places, and at the same time refine our targeting um, for exactly where we need to place that lesion, we might reach a point where the lesion-based treatment is as good as DBS. We no longer need the flexibility of turning on and off different contexts because we know exactly where we need to go. And at that point, I think lesion-based treatment might actually you know, come back into vogue for a lot of different indications, um, especially things like psychiatric disease, where um, it can be very anxiety-provoking to have electrodes in your head. So if you now want to make anxiety better, by putting electrodes in someone's head, you know you, you can almost work uh, counterproductively to the treatment that you're you're trying to to to, to get. Mm -hmm. Look, you've been um, very generous with your time, Mike. So I just want to want to ask your general um, opinion about the a little bit about the future, the uh, the advantages of brain stimulation. I mean, at the moment we're talking about connectivity. We're talking about getting very focal within the brain. Uh, with the past few decades, we've been very systemic with, with pharmacotherapy. Um, as we move forward, how do you see the fields all coming together or, 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 or working together? You, you'd mentioned you've opened this, this, this center for research to bring these fields together. How do you see things moving forward over the next couple of decades? Yeah, a, a lot. Well, so first, I hope a lot more people go into this um, this field, go into neuroscience, go into neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry. This is the time to go into the brain. Um, and it doesn't matter what brain symptom you're most interested in, the tools that we have available and the treatments that we have available, um, it, it's just a very, very exciting point in history to be, be working in this, this area. So I, I think the future is um, recruiting young talent into the field. Um, mapping symptoms onto circuits, independent of whether that's a neurology symptom or a psychiatric symptom, and then intervening on those circuits for symptom relief, independent of whether that intervention is a TMS coil, a DBS electrode, or a focus ultrasound lesion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, um, thanks very much, Mike. It's been it's been fantastic to speak with you, and uh, good luck with all your endeavors there, and you're pushing the field forward in a great way. So. Hope to see you again uh, next year at the next uh, Brain Stimulation Conference in Switzerland. That'd be great. Yeah, definitely. Get, get in some more beautiful hiking. Th thank you so much, Trevor, for having me. It was a great time. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Trevor. Have a great evening. Thanks for watching. If you work in the mental health field or you're a budding researcher in neuroscience, you might be interested in some of the other conversations I've had with other experts in the series. Please like, subscribe, and let us know what you think in the comments.